thank you. Good evening, dear guests. We are going further celebrating Kavrana's whole day. Hope you are all well and safe, probably sitting in your comfortable chairs at home and watching us with a glass of some lovely Vranets. I wish you a warm new welcome, and I would like to announce in behalf of Wines of Macedonia the next masterclass, Vranets as in Tem Temper of the South. It is a part of the Vranets World Day activities, unfortunately provided online this year due to pandemic situation. However, I must say that I'm much honored to introduce our next guest, which is considered as one of the most renewed wine experts for Southeast Europe, master of wine and our proud Branitz ambassador. Dear wine friends, Miss Caroline Gilby. Hello, Caroline. Hello. <laughs> okay, hello everybody and um, welcome. It's such a shame that I wasn't able to be doing this live in person, but that's that's the world we're living in at the moment. But maybe this way online, more people will get to listen in. And while I talk to you a little bit about the country of North Macedonia and this grape that is so important to the country and why I'm so passionate about it and why I believe that Central and Eastern Europe um, really is the last undiscovered part of the wine world and well worth discovering for those of you that haven't and for those of you that have started to dip your toe in these waters, you know, to encourage you to see more because the pace of change, the absolute revolution in winemaking continues you know every vintage gets better and better so I'm going to start with a little bit of background and some some slides and statistics so hopefully ah now I need to be have screen share, uh, sharing enabled please Elena so I can share my screen um, no I'm disabled still I will use this moment to thank you for spending your holiday with Vranitz wines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm in the very beautiful Lake District at the moment, and um, the wines have come with me so that I can talk about them. But also, um, the Republic of North Macedonia is a very beautiful country. Hopefully, you can all see the slides now and see what a dramatic place it is. And this is actually a scene that you see quite widely, the vineyards and the mountains around them. And that's a very important part of what makes this, this country a, such a successful place for growing grapes. So, and just to highlight, you know, where it is, it's part of, it's on the same latitude as many of the important world winemaking regions. As you can see, North Macedonia there, you know, fits in that band where great places like Tuscany, like Piemonte, like Bordeaux in France, the Napa Valley, and so on. So each region has its own specifics, of course, but they're they share the same, same latitude, that same band of quality winemaking. Um, so just to point out sort of, it's a landlocked country right in the heart of the Balkans. It's kind of right in the core of the, the Balkan Peninsula and it's bordered by Serbia, Kosovo, Albania, Bulgaria and Greece. Um, just over around 2 million people. So it's a small country. Um, you know, you could fit the population of North Macedonia into Greater London five and a bit times just to put it into some sort of uh, global perspective. But wine is really, really important. And it's a candidate country for EU membership now, having resolved the issue with Greece about country naming. Um, so just as my stupid country decides to leave the European Union, North Macedonia is making rapid progress towards becoming a member of the European Union. Anyway, <laughs> so as I say, it's a very, very beautiful country. Uh, mountains um, define it to some extent, but it's also, it's a very important cradle for, uh, for nature, but cradle of wine culture particularly there's a very very long history of wine growing 
grape growing and wine production in this part of the world, dating back thousands of years. I mean, obviously, very famously, Alexander the Great and his father, Philip of Macedon. Um, you know, Alexander the Great famously gave his warriors wines from the region for winning in battle and also for commiserations in battle, though that didn't really happen very often. Um, so, so wine was a fuel of, of this very important country a very long time ago. Uh, and it continues to be, you know, perfect clim climatic conditions for healthy grapes because it's southerly and it's warm and there are lots of mountain breezes and breezes that um, run up the river valleys, particularly the Vedar River Valley. There's very little disease pressure. So that means, you know, many wineries barely spray at all. So you don't have many agrochemicals in the vineyards. And I have to say, you know, the vineyards are full of wildlife. They're full of butterflies and they're even tortoises. You know, how cool is that? Vineyards with tortoises in. Um, so um, beautiful country, three national parks, uh, 34 mountains, say more than 2000 meters. I mean, that's way higher than I'm walking in the British Lake District. Um, 53 lakes, including particularly of note Lake Orid, which is one of the possibly the oldest lake in Europe with many, many indigenous species that occur nowhere else. So there's a really amazing environment here. And say a quick timeline of history. So back to the Bronze Age, um, ancient period, and there's good, you know, archaeological evidence for all these, these periods. Obviously, the Roman Empire was a, a very important part with the rise of Christianity and the burgeoning of wine culture. Um, no, Christianity was great for taking wine with it wherever it went, really. Um, Ottoman Empire, obviously, in this part of the world had um, had a serious effect on, on grape growing. And so there was a bit of distinct pause in development of wine culture during that period. Um, and then, of course, as everywhere in Europe, phylloxera, uh, the phylloxera infestation had a major effect as well. But, you know, everybody knows about that. Then, of course, we went into 20th century in Yugoslavia when it was all about volume and North Macedonia was a very important part of that volume production. You know, it was a, um, possibly the biggest region in, in former Yugoslavia for wine production. Um, and then it all changed after the Iron Curtain came down, the end of Yugoslavia and socialism the new era began. Um, and that's about the time I, I started to be involved in um, wine buying. As a young wine buyer, I was buying wines from Central and Eastern Europe, and that included Yugoslavia in those days. And then it became, you know, the different countries. And one of the things I've loved about this region is trying to get my head around, trying to understand and trying to tell everybody else about how each country has emerged so differently with its own culture and its own identity and very much reflected in wine and by wine. Um, so, you know, there's some fantastic, you know, ancient archaeology in the country where wine is symbolised, the grape vine is always the symbol of, of life and culture and so on. Um, and these amazing bronze vessels that were used for wine. And in those days, they used to make the wine very strong and add water to it so people didn't fall over. Um, but, you know, wine is very much at the heart of Macedonian uh, industry and culture. And indeed, you know, it's up there possibly between Ma North Macedonia and Republic of Moldova, both countries that are incredibly reliant on wine and grapevines for, um, you know, it's a really important crop for, for them, Macedonia very much so. Um, so unique terroir, as you can see in this slot, you've got the sloping hills, the sloping vineyards and the lake as well. And because of where it is in the Balkan Peninsula, you've got these 280 sunny days per year, the land of timeless sun really. 
And it's a point where the Mediterranean climate meets the continental climate. So you can get cold winters, but the Mediterranean influence alleviates that. Driest region on the Balkans, as I mentioned earlier, those that means healthy grapevines. And of course, there's the tortoise. Okay? There really are tortoises in the vineyards. Um, and um, so climatic zone 3CB, but you've got the continental influence from uh, the east and the Mediterranean influence from the west. And then the important lakes. And you can see from that little relief map quite how mountainous it is. And then you've got this really important valley right through the centre of the country where the majority, not all, but the majority of the commercial vineyards are. And it's the heart of uh, Macedonian wine production. So little run through some of the viticulture and winemaking. Um, so as I say, there's been an absolute revolution in, in countries like North Macedonia and a definite change of emphasis from sort of volume and bulk from the Yugoslav area towards premium quality and wine to be sold in bottles. And that has meant people hunting out the best vineyard sites, um, working with the best techniques, the best equipment. So tends to be a country where guio and double guio is used. So none of the big trellised vines that you got uh, further east in Eastern Europe. So that's a good start for quality winemaking. Pretty much everything is handpicked for quality, as you can see, picked into crates. That's, that's the story across all the wines I'm going to talk about tonight. It does get pretty hot in the summer. I mean, it can it can definitely get over 40 degrees, even by harvest time, mid-September onwards. So the best wineries will all have modern equipment with cooling, uh, cooling, stainless steel, everything you would expect for a modern wine country. But there is, luckily, there is quite a legacy of old vines, like the one you can see in this corner of the screen. Um, and again, you know, in the past, volume was the thing. Now, with lower yields, these old vines give naturally lower yields and the quality of the grapes, particularly Vranats, can really come through. So total vineyard area in this country is just over 33,000 hectares and under wine varieties, 28,000 hectares. Um, and then there are table, table grapes as well. No, wine production, nearly 91 million litres. Obviously, that varies by harvest and about 40 percent of that currently produced as bottled wine. But obviously, as a country, um, the shift is definitely earing towards bottled wine and better quality wines. Um, domestic market is still pretty small, though. Um, 74 registered wineries, lots and lots of great producers. but Wine culture in the domestic market is still small. Uh, there's definitely an opportunity for that to grow. Education, Svonko obviously is putting quite a lot of effort into wine education and building a culture at home, but exports are really, really important to, to Macedonia as well. Um, and they're currently exporting to around 38 countries, but obviously they'd be happy, I'm sure, to do more. So another vineyard shop. Definitely beautiful vineyards, well worth visiting. Um, um, and these are the three vineyard uh, wine regions. The western region, which is quite small, 1,800 hectares. The central wine region, which is nearly 25,000 hectares. So that's the important one. And then the eastern wine region, again, 6% of the vineyard. Sorry, eastern over here. Um, so... The main wine region that most of the wine comes from, 87% of the total vineyard area of the country. So you've got Skopje Wine District, which is a small part, um, Velesh, and then down to Tikvesh, which will, um, which is the most important with its 12,000 hectares, uh, Strumitsa, and I'll get one of the locals to pronounce the other regions, <laughs> Gevgelia Valandovo. Um, Tikvesh is nice and easy to pronounce though, and that's the most important. So, um, so 
Local grape variety is obviously very important in this region and particularly Vranats, which we're here to celebrate today. Um, and there are international grape varieties as well, but the local ones I'm finding, they're the ones that really communicate the place. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about. So Vranach, the untamed temper of the South. Um, it actually means a strong, black, powerful horse, a black stallion. Uh, Vran means black, like a raven. Um, and I like to, I think I've got a bit of analogy here that it's sprung from something that I was told in Serbia where they talked about prokopats being an ugly duckling turning into a beautiful swan. And I think for, with Vranats, you have to think of maybe in the previous era, you know, a run, a broken down skinny horse that was having to pull carts and, and do all the hard work. And then somebody else buys it and starts to feed it properly and gives it the right exercise. And then this beautiful, well-muscled, sleek, elegant black stallion appears from it. So, and I think that's kind of what what's happening with Ranats today. You know, it's, it's definitely a grape that makes uh, associated with wines with strength and potency, dark colours, 40% um, or so more polyphenols and anthocyanins than Cabernet Sauvignon. And we all know that Cabernet Sauvignon has a reputation for dark coloured wines. So uh, Vranats even more so. Okay, and some of the characteristics you get with the grape. So black cherries, black fruit, um, blackberries uh, are very strong characteristics. Um, acidity is a very important component because you can make, and quite a lot of these wines will have a lot of richness in alcohol, but what keeps the balance, and that's what I'm always looking for in quality wine, is I'm looking for balance. Alcohol weight per se doesn't matter as long as the wine's balanced and the acidity is the bit that gives it balance. Big body, um, tannins, um, I would say medium to full bodied wines and potential for, you know, quality and a beautifully long finish. So we'll start with the black fruits when it's young and as it ages. Um, you develop the more the prune notes, the um, tobacco, the leather, the cocoa, the coffee notes, sometimes a hint of floral characters, violets and so on. Um, so those are all things that you can find in your glass of Renats. Um, little symbol of, of the grape leaf there. Um, and so I think we'll have I'll keep this screen up while we have a look at actually um, a few bottles of wine, which I would love to be sharing with you in person. Um, but I'm afraid it's going to have to be remotely. But hopefully I will encourage you to um, go away and seek out some of these wines and taste them for yourselves. Um, so there's several things that I like about this great variety as a high quality grape variety and there are a number of things that I feel a high quality grape variety has to deliver and one is actually concentration and body another is versatility of style um, a third one is and versatility of style I mean that it gives winemakers opportunities to do things to make it you know to reflect their where their personal interpretations of the grape. Um, the third is that it needs to be able to communicate a, a sense of place. It needs to reflect where it's grown um, and be a, be a, offer something of its, its country, but its specific vineyard as well. So a real sense of place about it. Because you know, things like Cabernet, Sauvignon are grown everywhere, but things like Vranats, not so much. Um, so it's a grape that really, really belongs to the Balkans. The latest view is that it probably arose in the land that is Montenegro today. Um, but, you know, country borders, political borders have changed a lot in the last few hundred years. Uh, one of its parents is Kratoshia, also known as Zinfandel and Primitivo and Tribidrag and various other things. But 
What I think about Vranats particularly and northern Macedonia is that it's found its second home. It's, it's found its promised land, really, in North Macedonia. So North Macedonia has more of it than anywhere else in the world, with around 10,800 hectares. It only really arrived on any scale in the country in the 1950s. It was brought into an experimental vineyard just outside Skopje, and wine growers and winemakers really took took it to their hearts because it really does well in North Macedonian conditions. It enjoys the sunshine, but it also keeps good acidity. So um, I think now is a good time to actually start tasting some, some wine. So I shall pop a bit in my glass and I shall hopefully show you the first label. Um, of course, it's back to front, but it is Ranats from a producer called Movino. And it is the 2019 vintage. So it's a young wine uh, bottled under screw cap. Um, and this is um, so mostly most of the wines that I'm going to show you today are I'll talk about today are kind of definitely big, bold, full flavoured wines. But there is another dimension to this great variety where it can produce brighter fruitier, youthful styles of wine as well. So this has been picked uh, relatively early, quite low yield, though eight tons to the hectare, 15 year old vines, 12 and a half percent alcohol, pH 3.4. Um, and it's got this just really nice, attractive sort of black cherry, blackberry, hint of violets, little bit of spice. and just a nice juicy freshness to it nicely tamed tannin, tannins easy drinking I think you could serve this happily a little bit chilled you know 13 14 degrees and it would just make a very attractive bright summery sort of uh, summery drink so it's a family-owned winery quite new on the block only founded in 2015 and they are in the Tikvesh region, as I mentioned, the most important wine region. Um, and the idea here with this winery is they're really keen to develop uh, bottled wines and, um, you know, shift away a little bit from, from bulk. Um, so that's a very nice example of Ranats in its fresh, fruity, light, easy drinking sort of style. Um, so I'm then going to go on and show you. Mm, oh, no, it's got a black label, so it's not showing very well. Uh, OK, so this is Alexander from Bovin. So Bovin was actually the first private winery of the new era in um, North Macedonia, founded in 1998 by two brothers who are obviously very visionary about the future for, um, for wine in, Mas in North Macedonia. Um, so what we have here is actually a blend of, and it's Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Ranats, and it's one third of each. And they say this is the 2018 vintage. I'm just trying to get it on the screen so you can see the label a little bit better. <laughs> One problem with Zoom is it's not very good at black. But anyway, um, so they have pretty much all their own vineyards and the vineyards that they don't own, they manage. Um, and all their vineyards are at an altitude of between 312 and 400 metres. And actually, I think that's that's often very important as we develop this concept of or as producers in the country develop this concept of more premium wines is is seeking out their best vineyard plots it's um seeking out altitude it's seeking out older vines and altitude when you're in a warm sunny place like north macedonia you know that altitude gives you the coolness at night and that's really important for protecting that acidity which goes back to my point about balance again uh, so yes, hand harvested here, fermented in stainless steel, and there's no oak. So, 
So it's just about purity of fruit. And actually, I quite like this concept of a blend of international grape varieties with the Vranats in there that kind of is a bridge between the structure of Cabernet and the soft fleshiness of Merlot, the freshness and the cherry fruit of the Vranats kind of brings the two of them together. There's lovely richness and fruit sweetness here in this wine. Um, it's not going to work, this picture. Yay, I've got a picture of the bottle. Okay. Um, richness and fruit sweetness. Um, nicely tamed tannins, kind of fine grained. So, But the richness and fruit sweetness is balanced beautifully by the freshness. The pH here is only 3.2. So it carries its richness and fruit sweetness very well. And so it's a bit, um, this is from a vineyard planted in back in 1998, I believe. But, you know, really, again, nice expression of how this flagship grape, this beautiful black stallion grape can give a real sense of place to something that otherwise might be just another international Bordeaux blend. So I'm then going to take you on to another family winery. So this is a family winery called Pop Off. Let's try and get the picture on the screen. Hopefully that's, you can see it, Pop Off. So um, again, an early private winery, this family owned, but um, uh, Vladislav and his wife bought their first 1.2 hectares back in 2001 and as he says you know everyone in this country has a family history in wine somewhere you know so a lot of um you know if people have so he went and has made his money in his main business which is tv and internet uh but has returned a bit to his family roots um to have his first vineyard so that tiny 1.2 hectares rapidly built up to about 45 hectares to now in a village called Smolnik, um, where the soil is quite sandy clay and it's at about um, 300 metres in altitude. That altitude story is going to come through again and again here. Um, so let's taste the wine, shall we? So I should tell you, this is also 2018. This is 100% Vranats. Hand picked into crates again. Um, and here also we have no oak. So again, it's vinified in stainless steel with a pump over to handle the fruit very gently. It's got really nicely tamed tannins. This for me is brambly fruit here. This is brambles and blackberries. Um, nice freshness of acidity. Total acidity here is 6.3, which really helps balance that nice fruit sweetness. So a little hint of what I sometimes get in Vranats, which is a note of chocolate. Um, just starting to develop there, which gives it another, another dimension. So you no know, three different interpretations, young wine. So we've had the 2019 pure Vranats, we've had the blend, and we've had the 2018 as well. Um, focusing on the purity of fruit that this lovely grape can deliver here. Um, so I'm now going to take you on, hopefully, to, um, should be, if I've got my order correctly. So we're going back a vintage now. Uh, we're going to Puklovet's family winery and um, their instinct Vranats. Um, which has a nice stallion on the label, if I can get it to show properly. There. Okay, so back to front, but there is a prancing stallion on the label, which obviously is reflects the wine that is in the bottle. So it's hand-picked from 2017 vintage. I shall just have a quick call. So the Puklovets family actually can count their white family winemaking history back to 1934 in Slovenia. Um, 
and their, their other winery, their main winery is in Slovenia, near Jerusalem Ormosh, um, which is a great region for white wines, but it's not a great region for red wines. I mean, light red wines, elegant red wines, there's a little bit of, but actually, if you want to make serious red wines, as they quickly understood, that actually coming south and investing in a winery in North Macedonia was the way to go to, to start making serious red wines to add to their portfolio. So that's exactly what they did. Um, so they've bought a bit and set up a vineyard and a winery here. This is from the 2017 vintage, um, double guillo, stainless steel ferment, and this has been aged in oak for 12 months. Um, and again, um, Nice acidity here as well, but I'm just going to have a quick taste of the wine. Just so. hmm. Hmm. so yeah, black cherries there, brambles, hint of coffee, nicely balanced um, oak character, which gives just a little bit of velvety texture, a little bit of vanilla. But most importantly, it's a, it helps to complex the tannins. So we've got a nice mouthfeel here, um, really good texture. Um, still a young wine. I'm not sure that this has actually been released to, um, to the wider world yet. So um, lucky to be able to taste it, but definitely think one to watch. There's beautiful cleanness of fruit here, but the, the oak obviously adds a different dimension to it. And that's something, uh, again, something I think is really important about this grape variety is that it can make great wines without oak and it can also make beautiful wines with oak, which, you know, different dimensions for, uh, for the grape variety. So, um, yeah, a little bit of spice as well. They mentioned spice, but uh, so, yes, another. And ageability, that's going to be a theme that I'm going to mention as we go through this tasting as well. Um, that's another credibility thing for, um, for quality grape varieties. Right, so I'm gonna take you on to now a new, another producer called, um, yes, I forgot this in the right order. So Orla from Venec. Um, as you can see, they're very, I'll get this up on the screen, okay. Very proud, if you can see it there, of their Mundusvini um, Award, which is a gold medal in 2020. Um, so Ola is actually a specific vineyard. So I've been mentioning already about how producers are working at selecting their better vineyards to show what this grape can do with the right sites, uh, this sense of place, you know, that it reflects the quality of the vineyard. So this is a micro location in the Disan zone in the Tikvesh region, and it's up at 550 meters. And that kind of altitude makes a real difference to um, you know, cool nighttime temperatures, which is so important for protecting acidity and giving balance to the wines. So, um, and this is unashamedly, you know, it's a generous wine, 15 and a half percent alcohol, according to the label. But I think, well, I'm going to taste it first. <laughs> Huge richness here. So there's a kind of dried cherry character, almost a little bit sort of Amarone, Ricciotto like sort of character to it, but also with really nice freshness and acidity. And I think that's come from the fact these are 22 year old vines, so naturally producing good quality fruit. Uh, vine, their roots should be deep in the soil nice acidity, um, nearly six grams per litre of acidity. So that's what, um, have I read that right? No, 6.4 grams per litre of acidity. So that really carries that richness and, and that body and that texture as well. But say so beautifully sleek, grainy, fine grain tannins. And did we have, okay, yeah, we've got 12 months of new French oak. So, you know, creme de la creme, best oak for the best fruit. So I believe this, this is actually a winery that was established in 1954 as a grape grower um, and still that's their main business. 
But actually that puts them in a very good position because they only vinify about 10 to 15% of what they produce. So that means that actually they can pick and choose the very best of their, their grapes to make their own wines that they put their own name on, which I always think is a good position to be in really. So, um, so yes, and a really, really beautifully made wine there. Um, and like so many producers, you know, wanting to, to move towards showing what quality wines they can make from this amazing grape. So I shall now take you on to wine number six. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get that up on the screen if we can. Oh, it's determined not to wrap. Barovo, okay, from Tikbesh, the winery, founded in 1885 originally, and one of the most important, possibly still one of the biggest wineries in the whole Balkan region. Um, but have put a huge amount of effort into developing their quality, the quality wine side of their business. And in fact, this is a business that basically doesn't do any bottled wine, any, any bulk wines anymore. Everything gets sold in bottle. Um, such is their belief in the quality of what they're doing. And they've invested a lot of money in working with their growers to produce better fruit, doing huge amounts of research as well, working with um, Professor Clemen Lisiak from the University of Ljubljana, you know, looking at all the micro details of, of making better wines and understanding what Vranats particularly can deliver. Um, Winemaking consultancy from Philip Cambier, and in fact now their their winemaker Marco is a was a protege of Philip's, was working for Philip, and has was persuaded to come and work at uh, Tikvesh permanently. So Serbian born, but brought up in France, which uh, gives him a kind of. He explained it that he has an advantage of understanding the Balkan mentality and being able to speak to the growers and producers in this region in their own language, but also having that international experience and understanding what makes quality wine. And so the Barovo vineyard itself is a really special place. It is... Um, I put about 700 meters in the hills. It's surrounded by wildlife. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful sight in the mountains. It really feels like you're miles from anywhere up there. Um, and this is actually a blend of 65% Kratoshtia and 30% Vranats, 35% uh, Vranats, sorry. Um, so it's a kind of parent and child blend here um, because both these uh, you know, it's a field blend. Both these vines are in the vineyard and I personally think they work really well together. So 25 to 30 year old vines. So again, the old vine story, naturally low yielding. So beautifully clean, beautiful vineyard. Um, Handpicked, all the things you'd expect and 12 months in French oak. Mm. There's lovely richness here, sweet fruit, generous, but fresh as well, beautifully tamed tannins, nice and grainy. Definite hint of vanilla here, um, coming through on the palate as well. This is a very young wine. I was lucky enough to taste all the way back to 2009, 2010 at the winery a little while ago. And this wine does age beautifully. So, and I think it has all the components here. Um, the 2016 was, also, was an amazing wine, still is if you can get hold of it. And I think the 2017 will be. I just feel the oak is just not quite settled into the wine yet, but give it another three or four months. And I think, um, I think that that will be fine. But so it's beautiful fruit, beautiful intensity lovely black fruit, black cherries, spice, the coffee, the vanilla, um, and lovely length. And you've got that kind of slightly cherry character that comes from the Kratoshia in here as well. So slightly different to the other other wines we're looking at with the Kratoshia component, but 
you know, a lovely wine that has won great medals, you know, platinum at Decanter last for the previous vintage. I think it won 93 points at Decanter this year because um, and so on. So a wine to be proud of. And um, OK, so next one. Oh, this is going to be about another black label. OK, Veritas from Stoby. OK, so we're now going back to 100 percent Vranats and we're going back a year to 2016. Um, and so ageability is something that I do think is an important component of the argument for quality in a grapevine. Um, so. So we're now on a four year old. Four year old wine, so 100 percent Vranat. So. Um, so Stoby was founded in 2009 and they've spent, the owner has spent about 20 million euros on developing, you know, 600 hectares of their own vineyards and an amazing state of the art winery. And Vranats is really important to them. It's a real signature for them because it's 270 hectares out of that 600 hectares. Um, and 30 year old vines, so that natural intensity and depth um, and a slightly different approach in terms of winemaking and aging in that it is Slavonian oak here, um, casks and barrels for about 18 months, um, low yielding, just five tons to the hectare. Um, And I have to say, I thought this when I tasted it earlier and I thought this was a step up from the previous vintage. It's lovely blueberry fruit here. Nice freshness. It's kind of quite linear, but that length and freshness um, suggests to me that this is a wine that has a long future in front of it. Um, so, um, yeah, but looking really nice now. Sort of cherries, plums um, and just some hints of coffee and a little bit of sweet tea tobacco that complexity that I think uh, Ranats is very capable of and that gives it something so much more than just a, another fruity wine right which is what we want mm. um, okay so then I am going to take you on to okay so the god of wine, Dionysius Bacchus, you know, he le legendarily comes from this region. You know, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, and probably the North Macedonians as well would all like to claim, lay claim to him. But definitely a god who is really important in the history of this region. So for Dalvina, obviously, um, their top runners that they're so proud of. Um, has this brand name Dionys um, to reflect that, you know, to honour the god of wine. So again, this is another Mundusvini gold from uh, last year. I also think it was a decanter gold medal. And some of you might know that I'm a panel chair at Decanter World Wine Awards as well. So this is the Vranats Barrique. Um, and we'll just have 2016. So we're in the Strumitsa region here, still in the Vedar River Valley with its important, that whole river valley has uh, cooling breezes flowing up and down the valley um, and it's surrounded by, by mountains and also you get the breezes that drop off the mountains. So, and I do think this winery is kind of the last several years they've been working with uh, Professor Goran Milanoff from the University in Skopje and I think it, you know, the wines have come on leaps and bounds, really. So it was bought as a winery um, owned in, I can't remember when it was bought, actually, to be honest. I have to check that one. Anyway, it's an agricultural company who bought or leased the vineyards from the state and has gradually replanted them. But actually, this vineyard is... Um, it's 40 year old vines. So they obviously saw that actually these did not need replanting because they could deliver quality. 300 meters of altitude. <laughs> so, um, and low yield, 25 days on skins. 
And Goran, um, in terms of the oak treatment, he likes French coopered American oak, particularly for Vranats. So he likes that, that sort of coconut, uh, tobacco, um, coffee character that he likes with Vranats. So let's have a taste and see. Mm. Mm. There's real richness and complexity here. Uh, the oak, I think, is very well integrated. I'm not sure I would necessarily pick it out as American oak were, had I not been told it was American oak. You know, there's a sweetness to it, but there isn't that really sort of obvious coconut character. Um, and here, back in, this is 2016, so we've got, and I feel that I'm getting that real dark chocolate character, almost dark chocolate with cherries in it, um, plum damsons those little tiny small black plums um and so on so um and again those 25 days on skins have given it body and texture but also beautiful the tannins are beautifully complexed as well so um and please feel free if anybody's got any questions or comments as we go along because I've still got three more wines to talk to you about, and I don't want anybody to miss out asking questions if they've got any. Um, so, yeah, and that was picked very late, actually, in middle of October, that one. Um, so real ripeness of fruit, but also fresh. So, again, you had six grams of, so right? No, slightly lower total acidity there, but still nice freshness and texture, but it was the complexity I love about that wine and the way the oak's been handled that really adds a different dimension. Okay, so I'm going to take you to Chateau Kamnik, Grand Reserve Towa Selection. Uh, so this is very much a personal vision of the owner who set it up in 2004, and it's on a hilltop just outside Skopje. Um, and... Um, the winemaker Sandra has been working on her PhD along with Goran Milanov from the university. So a lot of research, a lot of care goes into the vineyards. Um, it's all about big but elegant, you know, and Sandra is, she's always beautifully turned out. She's very petite, um, but produces these big, elegant wines. Um, so, um, and Kamnik means rock, and it's on the top of this rock overlooking the city, but you because of that, you get the good sun exposure and you get beautiful breezes off the mountains. Um, so these vines are, um, the grapes are allowed to shrivel on the vine so that they're partially dried. So it's very generous in terms of alcohol at 16%. Um, but it has beautiful pH balance. So pH is 3.2 and the total acidity is 7 grams. 24 months in a mixture of new French and um, new U.S. oak. Um, there's a question about oak, actually, between American French and Macedonian oak when tasting. I think Macedonian oak gives quite a floral character, quite a balsamic character. American oak, for me, often gives coconut, as I've mentioned, and French is more subtle vanilla and maybe roasted notes like roasted coffee and so on um, but if the oak's well handled and the wine's mature and well integrated it's not always that obvious mm. Mm. so particular here I think you have to think about the balance of a good Amarone because it has that powerful that rich alcohol but the beautiful freshness as well, the layers of complexity, the coffee, dried cherries, the sweet fruit, um, so tobacco, um, particularly, um, you know, real cigar box sort of character. But that acidity gives it beautiful length and it carries it. So, you know, unashamedly rich wine, but also with the elegance that the winemaker and the owner is looking for. Um, so two more wines to show you and uh, say, do fire away any questions that you have. Oh, and I should have mentioned that the Kamnik um, 
partly mention it has this beautifully embossed sort of almost metallic label a um, bunch of gold medals all over the place um, and there was something else I was just going to say 2015 vintage so we're starting to get into those notes of complexity of age but also you know really good fruit here still too which is really important component of a way of a great great variety you know it can develop layers of flavor it can develop complexity and it can keep its essential character in there um, so i'm now going to take you even further back now to um, 2013 and this is let's get that up on the screen so you can see it it's run from chateau sopot um, which is a beautiful in a beautiful location in um, near Velesh, on a hilltop surrounded by sloping vineyards. And it was built in 2006 as the vision of the sort of two partners in this project, one of whom was a owned a construction um, business and the other um, an enologist. So that's a good compo uh, combination, really. Um, OK. Um, what do I think about the wines with the potential of prolonged bottle aging? This is the question I'm hoping to address now. So 2013 here. Um, so it's the Veshge micro district in the Vedar Valley and we're at 550 metres here. 10 days on skins. Um, again, that all important, nice total acidity. And this had 12 months in French barrels, Seguin Moreau. There's a rich kind of lifted dried cherry character here, some plums, some prunes, some warmth, a little bit of warmth here, some development, but it still has nice fruit and freshness. So I certainly, I would say this is ready to drink now. I don't think it's going to fall apart in the next, say, two or three years. I probably wouldn't want to keep it longer than maybe five years maximum, but to be honest, there's only one way to find out, um, you know, sort of because I think the problem is people have only been making Vranats in these premium styles for a few years and they've learned so much so quickly. What they're doing today in 2016, 17, 18 is probably not the same as people were doing in 13 or in the last wine I'm going to show you takes you back to is going to be the Markov Monastir from Scovin. Let's try and get that to show up. And um, this is, we're going back to 2011. Um, I don't see any reason why full-bodied runouts and lighter, fresher runouts can't coexist on the market. Um, you know, nobody minds that Bordeaux has light, lighter, fruity styles and big, rich styles. Same with Burgundy. Nobody minds that there are lighter, fruitier styles of Pinot Noir and then big, rich, serious styles of Pinot Noir. Um, one style more approachable as an introduction than the other. I mean, possibly the lighter, fruitier ones, but it very much depends on the market, I would say. I would say for the UK market that the lighter, fruitier styles are probably actually quite a good place to start. But I did a masterclass in Denmark a, a year or so ago, and the bigger and richer and rounder the wines were, the more the Danish loved them because they understand Amarone, they understand rich northern rhones so those big rich more alcoholic styles absolutely suit that market absolutely down to the ground so i think there's room for both and i think it there's a question of talking about the right um you know the right style for the right market um the lighter fruitier ones definitely would be the good place to start for for the UK, but uh, say, you know, very much depends on the market. Mm. And that's part of what makes it interesting. Okay. okay, so now we're going back to 2011 to the Markov Monastir, uh, which is 100% Vranach from Scovin, which is one of the biggest producers, 575 hectares of their own, I think. And this particular vineyard is up at 600 metres 
35 year old vines. Um, so that altitude, that old vine story coming through. Picked later than normal by a couple of weeks. Low yield, six tons to the hectare. Um, hand picked. And this is aged in large oak for 24 months. Um, so is it still alive? Can Vranach age is the question. And I would say the answer to that is yes. There is still some really nice dark fruit here, some wild blueberries some bilberries, um, lots of texture, um, definitely some overtones of coffee and some hints of uh, that kind of cigar box leather character. Um, I would say it's quite structured, quite a food wine. Um, you know, some hearty foods like winter stews and uh, for the meat eaters, um, meats, mushrooms, aubergines, that kind of thing for us vegetarian types. You know, so I think this is a wine that would particularly sing with some food. Um, do I see significant differences between North Macedonia and Montenegro? Um, I think I see differences in terms of the evolution of the wine industries of the countries, um, because obviously uh, Montenegro is very much dominated by one producer with you know, a massive vineyard and it's still partly state owned. What I think is benefiting North Macedonia at the moment, and, and to be fair to them, they are making some, some really good wines, um, no doubt about that and the great variety delivers in that country too. But what I do think is exciting in North Macedonia is you've got a bunch of producers who all share a vision and they share kind of values in how they want to see their country presented, how they want to develop premium wines and bottled wines, how they're happy to present a united front at wine, you know, at wine tasting, wine fairs and so on. And I think that produces a bit of friendly or perhaps behind the scenes unfriendly competition, but it, it kind of drives quality forward when you've got multiple producers of similar sizes kind of, you know, really, really working on improving things. So I think a bit of a uh, bit of competition behind the scenes is is not a bad thing. In, and the pace of change that I've seen in the in the country has been absolutely dramatic in the last few years and they've got something fantastic in Vranats to work with I think. Um, uh, fortified wine style my comment would certainly be I think it can make fortified wine styles but I think it's a pretty difficult market in most parts of the world um, trying to sell sweet red wines even for port producers it's quite a challenge so if producers wanted to make it, then that's fine. If there's a market for it, I'm not any. I'm not one to tell anybody not to do it. Um, don't make it your be all and end all commercial message. Do it as a niche for for the consumers that are interested. Is what I would say. Um, so what I'm hoping it's bang on seven o'clock now. So. I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't actually share these bottles in person with you, but I hope that at least you've been inspired to go away and explore more of this amazing country and the wonderful grape that is Vranats. And, you know, cheers to uh, Vranats World cheers. Day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for joining today on uh, celebrating Vranets World Day. Zvonko, you have something to announce for tomorrow? Uh, yes, actually, tomorrow we have uh, one uh, presentation, one webinar organized by uh, Wine and Spirits Education Trust. It starts 7 o'clock p.m. local time. Uh, it will be not so exhausting like this uh, tonight with 11 or 12 uh, bottles of very powerful runets, but uh, we present more for the foreign market uh, where we are, what our wine routes, some styles of uh, runets, possibility. So you are all welcome to, to, to visit this webinar. Caroline, thanks a, a lot. One more. Mm.
Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Enjoy some run-ups. <laughs> Cheers. 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 <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>